Hello and welcome to our webcast. Today's topic will be terminal unit selection. My name is Randy Zimmerman and I'll be presenting today's program. Today we'll cover the general guidelines that should be observed when sizing and selecting terminal units. We'll also look at the various options that are available and how they impact product performance. Although we will use Titus Teams software to make our selections, we won't cover the actual use of our software. We're only using it here to demonstrate how manufacturer software tools can be used to simplify the selection process. The most basic terminal unit is the single duct. It's commonly referred to as a VAV box or shutoff box. It typically receives its supply air from a VAV air handler. A variable frequency drive controls the air handler to maintain a static pressure measured two-thirds or three-quarters of the way down the longest duct run. Single ducts can provide either variable volume or constant air volume depending on the way the flow limits have been set at the box controller. If an air handler only supplies cooling, then interior zones will use cooling only units while the perimeter zones will, would most likely use some sort of heat. In this situation, any heat located at the box would be reheat. The box controls could also be used to operate auxiliary heat, such as a fin tube heater or a radiant panel. When there's heat in the air handler, it may be necessary to provide auto changeover controls so that the box can reverse its operation to provide both VAV heating and VAV cooling. Most of the single duct boxes, regardless of manufacturer, use the same round inlet and rectangular outlet configuration. This type of design reduces the inlet pressure requirement due to the static pressure regain that occurs when the air expands to fill the rectangular cabinet. The only real differences that distinguish between most manufacturers are lining options and inlet sensors on these types of boxes. Multipoint center averaging sensors are preferred because they can provide improved accuracy with poor inlet conditions. Although single duct boxes have very low pressure requirements, the addition of reheat coils, especially multi-row water coils, can result in inlet pressure requirements as high as one and a half inches of water. Single ducts are also often used as exhaust boxes in critical environment applications like laboratories and clean rooms. While the supply air is usually handled by constant volume boxes with reheat coils, the exhaust air often must be controlled to maintain either a positive or negative pressure in the room. Positive room pressure can prevent contaminants from entering a room, while negative room pressure can prevent contaminants from leaving a room. Unfortunately, there's a lot of confusion about exhaust boxes. Many engineers mistakenly select the same type of box that they would use for a supply. The round inlet with rectangular outlet configuration that provides static pressure regain in the supply mode works against the exhaust fan and therefore increases the pressure requirements. Even worse, many installing contractors have mistakenly installed supply boxes backwards thinking that the box must be flipped to work as an exhaust. All of these problems can be avoided by either selecting a purpose-built exhaust box or using a retrofit air valve with a round inlet and a round outlet. It should be noted that currently there's no industry standard for testing or rating exhaust box performance, but luckily ASHRAE Standard 130 and AHRI Standard 880 will soon be revised and expanded to cover exhaust boxes. So let's look at the basics of sizing boxes. My rule of thumb for sizing inlet ducts, especially for VAV applications, is to select for a maximum inlet velocity as close to 2,000 feet per minute as possible. I know that if I don't exceed 2,000 feet per minute, I shouldn't self-generate noise in the supply duct work. I also know that 2,000 feet per minute will keep my pressure drops low. Although it's tempting to oversize inlets for sound, this can easily cause control problems at turndown. I generally don't recommend trying to control less than 400 feet per minute in my inlet duct, so a 2,000 foot per minute maximum velocity gives me a very comfortable 80% turndown. Besides control problems, oversized inlets can also cause noise problems. Selection software can predict noise levels at maximum flow based on inlet velocity and pressure, but oversized inlets can result in air squeaking around damper seals at minimum flow. This results in pure tone noise. Since the noise created is dependent on pressure, the condition of the damper seals, and the roundness of the duct, this is a sound that cannot be predicted by any manufacturer's catalog or software. As far as discharge duct work, I like to think of boxes as devices that reduce velocity by 
If you have 2,000 feet per minute going in, you shouldn't have more than 1,000 feet per minute coming out. Discharge ductwork should therefore be sized for no more than 1,000 feet per minute. In cases where grills will be tapped directly into the sides of the discharge duct, I would design for no more than 800 feet per minute to prevent the possibility of room air being induced into the first few grills. Now let's look at coils. Since we're looking at coils for single duct boxes, these are typically reheat coils. They're usually supplied with 55 degree air. It's important to understand that the heating flow rate on a single duct box is probably not the same as the minimum flow rate. If our maximum flow is the cooling design CFM, our minimum flow is our ventilation CFM, and our heating flow is probably about 50% of our cooling design CFM. That's because we know that it typically takes twice as much air to cool a room as it does to heat a room. We certainly wouldn't want to ventilate a room at our heating CFM because that would unnecessarily subcool the room and we would then waste energy heating it back up. With today's digital and analog electronic controls, it's easy to control these three flow rates. Water coils are not intended to be used with steam, so our maximum entering water temperature will be 200 degrees Fahrenheit. For many years, the standard supply water temperature was 180 degrees Fahrenheit, but green building initiatives and the latest condensing boilers are dropping water temperatures as low as 120 degrees. Water from geothermal sources could even be lower. According to ASHRAE, discharge temperatures from overhead diffusers should never be more than 15 degrees Fahrenheit higher than the desired room temperature for good room air mixing and thermal comfort. So if we wanted a 75 degree room temperature, we should limit our discharge temperature to 90 degrees. If we assume 55 degree supply air, then we would likewise limit the temperature rise through our coil to 35 degrees. This means that we should have at least 27 CFM per MBH to limit our discharge temperature. In hot water coils, it's important to avoid low water flow. If water moves too slowly through a coil, it can go from a desired turbulent flow to a less efficient laminar flow. It's much better to move water more quickly through a single row coil than to move it too slowly through a multi-row coil. When selecting electric coils, you'll likely have a choice between staged coils and SCR coils. Stage coils split the total heat capacity in anywhere from one to three equal stages, whereas SCR coils modulate the heat capacity from zero to 100%. Modern SCR heaters provide extended service life and improved reliability through the use of solid state relays fired by digital control logic. Although UL sets a maximum discharge temperature of 120 degrees on all electric duct heaters, we should observe the same ASHRAE guidelines for overhead heating. Assuming 55 degree supply air, we should have at least 90 CFM per kilowatt during the heating mode.